But again, these were issues that have been raised a couple times, and Justice Merchant has not seemed very amenable to these arguments. The people's defense here is that, A, the publicity is not likely to abate anytime soon. B, that the defendant himself, Trump, has been exacerbating the publicity. Uh, and C, that there are other measures other than delay that can help mitigate this potential or alleged prejudice, uh, including in the jury selection process itself. I'm Benjamin Wittes, and this is the Lawfare Podcast, March 30th, 2024. It's another episode of Trump's Trials and Tribulations, this one recorded on March 28th in front of a live audience on YouTube and Riverside. I sat down with a big cast this week, Anna Bauer, Roger Parloff, Quinta Jurassic, Tyler McBrien, and a brief cameo appearance from Catherine Pompilio to talk about the Monday hearing in New York, where Judge Mershon ordered a new trial start date of April 15th. We also talked about the Thursday motions hearing in Fulton County, and why the Fulton County case isn't stayed as the defendants appeal Judge McAfee's decision not to disqualify District Attorney Fonnie Willis. We discussed Roger Parloff's article about what the government can do about Judge Cannon's odd proposed jury instructions, and we talked about bar disciplinary proceedings against John Eastman and Jeffrey Clark. And of course... We took audience questions from the Lawfare Material supporters on Riverside. It's the Lawfare Podcast, March 30th. Trump's trials and tribulations, two weeks until a trial. We had seemed to have a, a date certain-ish, Tyler McBrien, for a trial. You were there along with Catherine. Uh, you were there in court on Monday when Justice Mershon rescheduled the trial. Uh, give us an overview of what happened. Uh, yeah, as Ben said, Catherine and I were in the courtroom on Monday, March 25th, which, uh, if, if listeners or viewers recall, Justice Mershon had called that a date certain for the start of the trial, um, which was not so certain because we found ourselves in court on Monday uh, for yet another pre-trial hearing. There, Justice Merchan was was uh, reviewing three questions, essentially. And uh, essentially what had happened was um, the Southern District of New York had, uh, earlier this month, turned over tens of thousands of documents to uh, DA Bragg, who in turn turned them over to uh, the defense. Um, and, and because of that, Justice Merchan had granted a, a brief adjournment. And so we found ourselves meeting uh, Justice Merchan as I said, was reviewing three questions. Who, if anyone, was at fault for these late-breaking documents? Uh, what prejudice, if any, was suffered by either party? And third, uh, what sanctions may, may be necessary because of, of this? He essentially uh, ruled that the DA was not at fault. Uh, in fact, the DA had satisfied all of its discover discovery obligations, had in fact gone above and beyond uh, in this regard, that no prejudice was suffered by Trump um, and that no sanctions, therefore, were necessary. And he seemed, at this point, to set a even more certain trial date for April 15th. Although, uh, as we'll talk about um, shortly, there will be, uh, there was, there, there is one more um, motion to dismiss and or adjourn. Um, but it doesn't look likely that, that that will be successful. So, we have a, a date even more certain for April 15th, uh, on the day, the day in which jury selection will begin. What was the mood like in the court? Because, you know, from from the dispatch you guys wrote, it seemed like, first of all, Trump was present. It seems like Justice Mershon was pretty pissed off. Um, so, like, talk about what it felt like in the court. Was it tense? It was. Um, I think Justice Merchan has a reputation for being very calm, cool, and collected in court. And I don't think he... he he didn't blow his cool, but to contrast it with the February fifteenth hearing, Todd Blanche, who was um, one of one of Trump's lawyers, had a bit of a you know a repartee with with Justice Merchan in the, in the previous hearing. Uh, none of that was existent this time. There were there were no laughs. I would say no no chuckles, and and Justice Merchan took quite seriously the allegations that that Trump had laid out in the letter accompanying the motion to dismiss, which essentially alleged that. Um, alleged prosecutorial misconduct on on the side of the people, and importantly, um, suggested complicity 
in this misconduct on the side of Justice Merchan, um, which I think the judge took rightfully very seriously. So that kind of set the tone, and there was uh, a lot of... Justice Merchan often cut Todd Blanche off when he felt that Blanche was not giving any new information, was going uh, off on tangents that he had heard before, and was was quite short with him at, at times. And what was Trump doing? This was like a two and a half, three hour hearing or something. What was he up to during it? Was he engaged? Was he tweeting? Was he zo- or truthing? Was he zoned out? Like last hearing, he was quiet. He just he had his hands folded in front of him on the table, looking ahead. Uh, it was really hard, honestly, to to read him. Um, last hearing, I was I was behind him uh, in the actual courtroom, so it was, I didn't actually get to see his face. This hearing, I was able to view him on the screen, and he was fairly stone faced. Um, he's consulted with his lawyers a few times. He, he beckoned Todd Blanche over at one point and and asked him a few questions at length. But that was about it. I don't, I'm curious, Catherine, if you had a, a different experience of of reading Trump's demeanor or, you know, his mood. But I honestly couldn't get a read. He was fairly um, kept it close to the chest. Yeah, Catherine, what were your impressions of the the courtroom ambience? Trump himself, as Tyler said, was pretty much very stone faced the entire time. I did catch one smile from him to Todd Blanche right at the beginning. But other than that, just kind of, as Tyler said, hands crossed on the table, not really looking at anybody except for the judge and Blanche. The courtroom itself, Judge Mershon was very kind of no BS in that um, he wasn't really willing to hear any stumbling or fluff. Um, He was really wanting to hear in regards to the amount of documents that were relevant to the case. Um, straight numbers rather than just kind of estimations. And I think from what I could gather was a bit annoyed, I, I think, that we were even there in the first place. That was kind of the overall vibe I got in the room. So one thing, bit of fallout from this uh, hearing was related to the so-called gag order. Tyler, bring us up to speed on that. Sure. So uh, sh- this week, uh, Justice Merchan issued a gag order uh, against Trump from uh, speaking about any potential witnesses, counsel other than the DA, court staff, uh, DA staff, and their families, uh, and a- any jurors or prospective jurors. Um, notably, Justice Merchan himself and his family were not included in the gag order, uh, a fact which Trump took, uh, I think, full advantage of in, in truthing uh, about Justice Merchan's daughter and his, and her past employment, which he accused her of, um, of I, I think, working for Joe Biden, Kamala Harris, Adam Schiff, um, using their respective nicknames that he has for them. But as I said, it didn't violate the gag order uh, itself, um, but it, it you know, obviously, I think, was meant to have a, a chilling effect of some kind. Tell me about what happens next. So we ha- you mentioned that there was a order or that that there is a subsequent motion to an adjournment. How is that motion different from what we've already gone through in the court? And you said you don't give it much prospect of success. Why is that? And should we assume we're actually going to have a trial start on April 15th? Or are there things you can foresee that would get in the way of that? The motion... Uh to, it's a, another motion to dismiss and or uh, adjourn the trial uh, because of um, prejudicial pretrial um, publicity. Although I, I believe this is the first time that they've issued a, a motion on these bases, the, the, the idea of prejudicial publicity, you know, poisoning a, a potential jury pool has come up a few times. Uh, it, it came up at the last hearing. It came up at this hearing. So when uh, Blanche mentioned at the very end of this, this week's hearing that he would like to ask the court's permission to file this motion, which the with Justice Merchan had, had finally granted. Apparently, he'd been asking for a couple of weeks now, um, but Justice Merchan wanted to wait until this hearing was settled to, to, to grant that request. Um, the people stood up immediately and, and um, re- responded, but nonetheless, uh, Blanche and, and Trump filed the motion. They, uh, they are asking for an adjournment. Uh, the, the people have one week to respond. But again, these were issues that have been raised a couple times, and Justice Merchan has not seemed very amenable 
to these arguments. The people's defense here is that, A, the publicity is not likely to abate anytime soon. B, that the defendant himself, Trump, has been exacerbating the publicity. Uh, and C, that there are other measures other than delay that can help mitigate this potential or alleged prejudice, uh, including in the jury selection process itself. All right. So are we assuming that jury selections beginning April 15th then? Cautiously, I'm saying yes, but someone else can feel free to push back if they- Yeah. Anybody want to yeah. push back on this and and posit a theory of delay or, or do you all think uh, we are heading to trial? I mean, never say never, right? But <laughs> it certainly does look like we're heading to trial. I think we're heading to trial. He said, see you on the 15th. Look, I'm taking Judge Mershon at his, or Justice at his word. What about you, Roger? Are you betting on trial? Uh, yes. Yeah. No, he's a pretty tough guy. All right. Let's move on to the next court. Roger, down in South Florida. Has um, Judge Eileen Cannon ruled on anything? Nothing to speak of. Um, there's there's a lot of, yeah, there's a lot of stuff piling up. Uh, we did actually get a ruling in a SEPA Section 4 matter. I might have mentioned that last week. I can't remember. Yeah, I did. Okay. Yeah, the and government I, seems in, these are sealed rulings, though, yeah, right? Right. Yeah. So we can't actually read any of them. Right. We do know that one aspect of that, she wants more information, so there will need to be another uh, hearing, a SEPA Section 4 hearing as well. But, um, you know, we had the hearing uh, back on March 1st to find out when the trial would be, and that still hasn't been decided. Yeah, so no, no trial date yet. No. I think we've got uh, you know, uh, we have a huge motion to compel, uh, with, right. which hasn't been decided, and sort of adjacent to that are a bunch of decisions to be made about whether certain exhibits can be unsealed or not. None of those decisions have been made. And there was that motion to reconsider uh, that the government filed on unsealing a whole bunch of things, right? That's no, no movement on that, right? No, uh, nothing on that yet. There are, by my count, and it's difficult to count because a lot of things are now not docketed, and that's a, a, its own story, but um, there, there are about 13 motions to dismiss or to suppress. Um, only one of those has been ruled upon, and that was a uh, denial without prejudice. <laughs> <laughs> meaning, meaning you can re-raise it, and actually there was a there was a, a, a sort of an indicative, um, at, at least seven of those thirteen motions are fi not filed publicly, and uh, we had a mo we had some the government yesterday w filed something which is uh, emblematic. They they were. They wanted to file a sir reply, you know, the way the motions practice works. You file a, a motion, the other side files a response, and then the original side files a reply, and the government felt in this situation a sir reply was necessary. But what was interesting about it was that it, it noted that the reply it was responding to was not docketed yet, and the reply was a related to a response that wasn't docketed yet, and the response related to a motion that wasn't docketed yet. So it's yeah. undocketed all the way down. Yeah, and I think that goes back to assuming the first was circulated, I won't say filed, it wasn't filed, it was circulated on time, it would have been February 22nd. So these things are uh, uh, piling up. All right. So um, you noted in a text to me before the show today that um, there was an amusing, I'm not sure whether to call it absurdity or inanity, uh, in some of the vocabulary that Trump's counsel were now using in this case. I don't really know how to set up a question for it. So I'm just going to ask you to tell me about the text that you sent me. Well, it's just, I, I just happened to belatedly notice something. I mean, all along, of course, 
his attorneys very scrupulously call him President Trump, President Trump. In this case, they were referring to his presidency, and they referred to it as President Trump's first term. And uh, so I, I guess they're, uh, uh, this is a new... Uh, Measuring the drapes. Yeah. So uh, I think they're buttering up the client uh, uh, with, with these things. Kind of All right. Me. So let's talk about a, a substantive matter going on in Judge Cannon's courtroom, which was last week we talked about the problem of these uh, proposed jury instructions that she's sort of trial ballooned uh, and asked for a briefing on. Uh, and you uh, explained that the only way to challenge these, um, if she were to actually issue such a jury, jury instruction, would be through a mandamus action, and that such mandamus actions are very rare, and um, and by the way, it would be pretty urgent because if the jury received such an instruction and acquitted, that would not be reviewable. Um, and so, in the subsequent days, you ran a you did some legal research about the history of judges issuing outrageous jury instructions and prosecutors responding by seeking a writ of mandamus. For those who want the whole article, uh, there it's there on Lawfare. We will share the uh, link. But Roger, give us a sense. If Eileen Cannon issues an outrageous jury instruction, can Jack Smith go to the 11th Circuit and say, outrageous jury instruction, issue a writ of mandamus to direct her to issue a normal, coherent, lawful jury instruction. What is the history of that sort of thing? And uh, does he have a prayer? Yeah, he actually has a prayer. Um, there are, uh, and uh, I, I asked a few lawyers and supplemented that with some very rudimentary research of my own, but mainly uh, uh, this is thanks to the generosity of some lawyers. Um, I found six cases, uh, none of them in the 11th Circuit, um, four in the 3rd Circuit, which uh, involved cases out of um, uh, Pennsylvania and New Jersey, and two uh, from New York, out of, uh, from the 2nd Circuit, coming out of uh, cases in Manhattan. And um, in uh, several of them, it was possible for the prosecution, for various reasons, to bring a motion in limine before the jury was sworn in, um, which is how you would like to do it, because that's the Rubicon moment when the jury is sworn in, That that's when jeopardy attaches. And after that point, if anything goes wrong, if the jury needs to be disbanded, there's going to be a, a strong argument that you can't you retry it. And um, so it's very dangerous. The two uh, petitions in uh, New York... Um, were actually after the jury uh, was uh, uh, convened and it was sworn in. And the Second Circuit was very cooperative, which you need. In one case, they uh, stayed the trial and um, held oral argument the same day, uh, 2 p.m., you know, uh, they, they stayed it in the morning and, and, and held oral art and then decided the next day in, in a, you know, a hundred words. So, uh, yeah, it can be done. It, it, it's obviously all mandamuses have to be extreme things. A mandamus is like when you don't have an interlocutory appeal, you don't have a, an appeal as of right by statute, but there's this common law writ called mandamus. And there's a statute called the All Writs Act that, you know, gives appellate courts all the powers that common law courts used to have. So, but it's supposed to be, people describe it as drastic or extraordinary or exceptional. So it's, it's a hard thing to get. But I think what we saw now, of course, what, what uh, would, would qualify. <laughs> the, the important proviso is that, and Ben said this, what she did on March 18th was merely invite briefing, invite comments. She did not say, here's what I'm going to do. You would need something much more 
written in stone. I've made my decision. Here's what we do. And that's what gets tricky. That's why it sometimes can't be done until, you know, uh, the jury has been sworn and it's three days, two days before summation or the day of summations, you know. So that's where it gets very tricky. Right. And so what is the case that you found that is most similar to this one that you that you said boy if i were jack smith i would i would feel pretty good about the second or third circuit having ruled this way in this case well there's a very good um uh there's good language in a third circuit case from 1994 which was a uh tax case and basically the judge proposed a jury instruction that would almost certainly uh, result in acquittal, and it was against uh, a clear precedent. The other case, you know, the Second Circuit cases are important because it shows that you could even do this after the jury is sworn. They aren't perfect because here, in most of these cases, it was crystal clear there was binding precedent going the other way. And um, we don't have that here because it's such a, an unusual case. But um, there's two reasons I think it's still doable. Um, one is uh, you have a, an instruction that does amount, I mean, one of them, one of them that was being proposed did seem to amount to instructing jurors to acquit. And it's telling, she was telling them that for a, a president to basically abscond with 300 classified documents is per se, we deem that to be uh, designating those as personal under the Presidential Records Act. And we further deem the Presidential Records Act as having silently repealed the Espionage Act to the extent that... Uh, uh, there's any any potential interplay, meaning, uh, uh, I mean, the government's position is the Presidential Records Act is completely irrelevant here. The, the thing that gives you authority to possess classified documents is an executive order, in this case, 13526. So there's a series of highly improbable things going on here, and... Uh, I, I, I think, given the stakes and the, uh, the, that they would they would uh, intervene. There's there's one last thing, which is in one of these cases, um, the government had said in addition to mandamus, they they tried to sneak it in under interlocutory appeal by saying, well, the the instruction really amounted to a dismissal of the count because you couldn't meet its requirements. And the, the, on those facts, the, the court rejected that. Here we have this interesting phenomenon where she held a motion, a hearing on a motion to dismiss. And then she said, okay, I'm going to deny the motion to dismiss without prejudice to you bringing this up in the context of jury instructions. And then she issues Four days later, a really out there jury instruction. And so you could say, well, this is the equivalent of a, of a dismissal. I mean, even she seems to regard it as such. She said the quiet part out loud. So I think there's an argument that maybe you could even uh, present it that way, in which case you wouldn't have all of the... Uh, it, extraordinary, exceptional, drastic hurdles to meet of a mandamus. But you would have to have a ruling from her. <laughs> yes, you would have. Right? Yeah. I mean, one, one of the things that's so frustrating about her as a jurist is that she doesn't actually rule on anything. So you have these suggestions in requests for briefing. I'm entertaining holding that the Presidential Records Act gives Donald Trump the authority to remove the Resolute Desk and put it in Mar-a-Lago by declaring it a personal record, 
um, and that that would, you know, trump all, no pun intended, trump all of the theft statutes. Um, please brief this question for me. But then you don't actually hold that. So when you try to contemplate an appeal, there's just nothing there. It's kind of vaporous. And so my question is, what would she actually have to do before Jack Smith? You write in the piece that there's no doubt that she hasn't yet done enough to take an appeal. So how much further would she actually have to go before Jack Smith on with his itchy trigger, trigger finger, who wants to pull the trigger on filing a writ of mandamus, but he's holding himself back because there's nothing but vapor uh, to respond to. What do you need before there's actually something to appeal? Well, you de- do need, uh, you know, a statement on the record. Okay, I've made my decision. We're using these. And usually what the government then does is says, uh, we're moving to uh, for rehearing of that of your ruling, reconsideration of of your ruling, and then he denies reconsideration, and then you take it. So it it, it really and and you often see that you know the judge will start deliberating maybe three days before trial, and then on the day of trial, in one of these cases it was the day of trial he decided, and then the jury was selected but not sworn in. And so he disbanded the whole jury. All of that was lost uh, after the second, a- after the appellate court granted the stay. He would not grant the stay. So, um, you know, it's a real game of chicken. And, and like I said, with the Second Circuit, it was into trial and it was as the summations are approaching, they finally had a jury conference. Uh, that's how it usually works. You have a jury conference once you've seen sort of what the evidence in the case is, you can't really write the all the all the instructions before you've seen how the evidence came in. So it's it's late in the game. It'll be it would be very hard. All right. Next court, Anna Bauer, Judge McAfee, or as we call him, Boy Wonder, held a hearing today, and it was not about the sex lives of any of the attorneys present or absent in the courtroom. What did he hear motions about? He heard motions on three substantive issues of law related to the substance of this case. It was great, Ben. I was very happy not to be in Cobb County Superior Court Divorce Court. Uh, It was super comfortable, right? We were sitting there watching Steve Sadow argue a First Amendment motion, very similar to the motion that they filed in uh, uh, Judge Chutkin's courtroom a few months ago. It was almost like a normal Trump case. Right. And it wasn't just that it was similar to the one filed in uh, Judge Chutkin's courtroom. This is, might be familiar, this First Amendment argument, which was the kind of first of three motions that were heard today, uh, because this is already an issue that Judge McAfee heard argument on last fall when Ken Chesbro and Sidney Powell were about to go to trial. They filed a bunch of their pretrial motions very early on because they were the defendants who filed speedy trial motions. Uh, Judge McAfee rejected their First Amendment argument uh, on grounds that it was not ripe, meaning that he thought there needed to be more factual development. And Anna, what when we talked to Ken Chesbrough's lawyer about this motion, what did I say to him on the podcast? Is that what you, did you say? He was going to say that it wasn't ripe? Is that what you said? I don't recall. No, no. I said, this one's a loser. You're, oh, you're that's not going right. to win Yeah, you said, one. let's move on to the ones that aren't the losers. Uh, but yeah. uh, it's it's interesting because, so this is an as-applied First Amendment challenge. Uh, you can have a, a what's called a facial First Amendment challenge where you're arguing that the law itself, uh, no matter who it's applied to or what conduct it's applied to, would be unconstitutional. It's just, you know, it, the law itself is written in a way that would make it unconstitutional in violation of the First Amendment. An as-applied challenge, however, means that it is unconstitutional 
as applied to whatever given conduct is alleged in the indictment, uh, here meaning uh, a number of different actions or conduct by Trump or speech by Trump that relates to the 2020 election, things like tweets, uh, uh, various statements that he made at meetings, that kind of thing. Some of them are actual actually relate to this conspiracy to, you know, make false statements or or submit fraudulent documents for the electors uh, charges. But some of it also, it just includes overt acts that are alleged within the RICO conspiracy to overturn the 2020 election. So there's a number of different things and all of it Trump's uh, attorney, Steve Sadow, says uh, violates the First Amendment because the argument is that that is all core protected political speech. Uh, they cited a case called Alvarez, which is a Supreme Court case, to kind of make the draw this principle out of, you know, that you can't just criminalize false false statements for the sake of criminalizing falsity. But a big part of the hearing related to this issue that we'd already kind of been through, which related to the ripeness of the challenge. Uh, previously, Judge McAfee had looked at some Georgia case law in which he made the determination that at this stage, before there's been any kind of factual development in the case, before you know there's been any evidence presented to a jury or any cross-examination, any witnesses, uh, that basically he could not decide the motion at this stage, it, there was kind of the implication that uh, later the it would be appropriate to raise it at a kind of directed verdict stage after the evidence has been presented. But subsequently, when Trump raised this motion of his own, he cited to some Georgia case law that they found uh, a case called Hall in which uh, the, they seem to think stood for the proposition that the court could just look at the facts alleged in the indictment and, and decide based on those facts in the indictment whether or not this as applied challenge, uh, could succeed. Uh, and so there was some argument over that threshold issue of whether Hall, uh, you know, changes, uh, the outcome of this First Amendment challenge. And then we got into, you know, the qu argument on the merits. Uh, beyond Steve Sadow's, you know, arguments about this being uh, protected political speech, the state responded to that saying, well, even if you do look at the indictment and even if Judge McAfee does decide this issue now, you know, in conduct that is integral to criminal activity is not something that is protected by the First Amendment. Uh, and for that reason, even if you go ahead and decide this issue, Judge, uh, it's something that Trump cannot succeed. And on the RICO issue, there's the fact that, you know, putting aside the other discrete crimes, uh, in terms of the overt acts that are alleged, it really doesn't matter if the conduct that are that includes these overt acts is legal, if it's protected First Amendment activity, all of those things can still uh, count toward, you know, in, in, count, so to speak, towards uh, proving this RICO charge, because even something that is legal conduct or otherwise legal conduct, even something that is First Amendment protected speech can be considered an overt act that is is done, in, you know, in furtherance of an unlawful uh, conspiracy or RICO enterprise. Uh, so there's there's that argument as well. Uh, and that was the main part of the hearing, I think, was that First Amendment argument. We also had David Schaefer, who uh, his counsel, uh, Craig Gillen, addressed two motions one of them dealt with a number of different discrete crimes, uh, including, for example, whether the uh, fake electors can be considered public officers under Georgia's uh, statute. Uh, there's not really a definition of what a public officer is, and and David Schaefer is charged with impersonating. Except that it includes it, it, whatever the definition is, it includes representatives of fake law enforcement yes, agencies. Yes, that's what I was going to say. That I think that the one thing that became clear during this argument. Uh, the state in its briefing made the point that 
you know, judge, there's a case under Georgia law that's been, you know, uh, where it's been upheld that you can impersonate an agency that doesn't exist. There was someone who impersonated a police officer from a fake, you know, uh, police agency. I think, do you remember what it was called, Ben? The Atlanta Metro? It was, it was some kind of sex trafficking task force and it was a fiction, but the guy pretended to be an officer of it. And that was held to be impersonating an officer, even though the person you're in, it's like impersonating Superman, you know? You're right. I think it was like the Atlanta Metro Human Trafficking Task Force or something, some a fake law enforcement agency. Uh, and so Judge Mack- Children was- out there, uh, when you impersonate an officer, make sure it's an officer of a real law enforcement agency. Just your, your crime tips from here on Trump trials and tribulations. Very important. Uh, because people can Google, you know, the, the law enforcement agency that you're purporting to represent. And it doesn't work if they Google it and they get, you know, no, no response. Right. And the other uh, interesting moment was when Will Wooten for the prosecution raised the fact that while Craig Gillen is in state court arguing that the electors are not public officers, they are at the same time in federal court appealing their removal, uh, you know, f- uh, denial of being able to remove the case to federal court on grounds that they're arguing they are federal officers. So uh, there's this kind of tension there. I think that probably, uh, you know, Craig Gillen uh, could make a nuanced argument as to why those two things are not coextensive. But uh, there, there's still, it seemed to be the case that Judge McAfee maybe wasn't buying the argument uh, on that specific discrete uh, impersonating a public officer uh, crime. Uh, there, there also were a number of other issues that were raised in David Schaefer's motion that I'm not going to spend too much time on. Many of them related to arguments about the, uh, you know, RICO charge that had already been raised in the Chesbro and Powell pretrial proceedings, uh, things like uh, insufficient allegations regarding the nexus between uh, the enterprise and and um, some of the, you know, allegations in the indictment. So things like that. And then finally, what am I missing, Ben? Oh, there was also a motion by Schaefer uh, regarding striking legal conclusions about the fake electors from the indictment. Uh, The indictment uses uh, a a number of kind of references to unlawful uh, electors or, you know, fraudulent electors or fraudulent slate, those kinds of things, which uh, David Schaefer was making the argument that those are legal conclusions that should be stricken from the indictment. Uh, it seemed to me, and I'm curious if you agree, Ben, but I think that Judge McAfee did not think that it was appropriate at this stage of the proceedings to really get to in the weeds on, uh, you know, what should or should not be stricken from the indictment, uh, and that he didn't seem to think the form, because remember, in Georgia, They're very, very, uh, you know, kind of strict about the form of motion that you are using. Uh, and, and so he kind of made a reference to, uh, we're not the type of motion and that you are using at this stage is not really appropriate for doing what you want to do. But at the same time, there was some talk of whether, uh, at some point, uh, some of these phrases or words might be stricken as surplusage. Uh, so things that, you know, really aren't maybe necessary uh, in in terms of having in the indictment. So, yeah, I think that that pretty much covers what was discussed. There's no uh, indication on when McAfee might rule or or really how he might rule other than the things that we just mentioned. Yeah, I will just say we know how he's going to rule. These motions are going nowhere. (laughs) They are, as I would say to Steve Sadow, I'm sure it is important to uh, preserve these questions for appeal. These are loser motions, and uh, uh, they are going nowhere. And in the next few days, you will see curt orders from Judge McAfee saying, these are jury questions. But that's just one citizen's opinion. 
I have one more question for you, Anna Bauer, which is why is Judge McAfee holding hearings on these dispositive motions when he's just certified uh, for interlocutory appeal the disqualification question? Shouldn't he be waiting for the Georgia Court of Appeals to finish talking about the sex lives of of the officers of his court before he turns to these substantive motions that we should only be hearing from 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 lawyers who are uh, not conflicted in any way? Right. It's an interesting question because before this, before Judge McAfee issued a certificate of immediate review on the order denying Fonnie Willis's disqualification, I'd been talking to some Georgia appellate lawyers about this issue. They all seemed to think that, you know, when the certificate of immediate review was issued or, or after a notice of appeal was filed, that that would effectively stay the case in its entirety. Uh, uh, because in typically in Georgia, there's generally this there's this term called supersedis. I I don't know how common it is used in the uh, federal system, but when uh, something goes up on appeal, it functions as a supersedis of um, the lower court's jurisdiction, uh, and so things kind of are put on pause. But in Judge McAfee's issuance of the certificate of immediate review, he said that you know this isn't a final judgment, uh, and and supersedis only applies as to the order being appealed, not to the case as a whole. And he cited a number, uh, or I think it was two uh, Supreme Court of Georgia decisions in which there's some favorable language to support that proposition that the case as a whole isn't stayed. Um, uh, and so I went and looked at those cases, and they do seem to uh, indicate to me that he seems to be on the right side of the law in that respect. Um, one of the cases uh, is an 1888 case um, in which the Supreme Court of Georgia favorably cites some language from the Court of Appeals in an earlier decision saying the mere filing of a notice of appeal does not divest the trial court of complete jurisdiction. In a criminal case, the filing of a notice of appeal merely deprives the trial court of its power to execute a sentence. So as long as McAfee does not lock him up, to be quite literal, uh, he can he can get all the way to pronouncing a sentence. Right. And and then later, there's a 2022 case from the Supreme Court of Georgia in which they uh, cite to this concurring opinion uh, in a case uh, called Stiles, uh, and they favorably cite this uh, uh, justice who, you know, wrote specially or separately from the rest of the court in which he went through this, like, very lengthy explanation of how he sees uh, the appeals process working in terms of divesting the trial court of jurisdiction. And he explained that, you know, basically it, the uh, loss of jurisdiction resulting from an appeal in a criminal case applies to all proceedings which either require a ruling on the matters on appeal or directly or indirectly affect such matters. So uh, basically this, you know, special opinion agreed with this this other opinion in which it, the the justice was saying, you know, it's not all of the jurisdiction that is lost. It's just things that relate to the order being appealed. However, there is some language in there, you know, for example, that jurisdiction is only lost as to matters directly or in that directly or indirectly affect what's on appeal. So I think that's some language that indirect effect could be something that people like Sadow or Ashley Merchant might really, you know, latch on to uh, when they are filing their application for interlocutory appeal and trying to convince the Georgia Court of Appeals to stay all of the lower court proceedings and, um, you know, make the argument that it's a complete loss of jurisdiction because you could make the argument that disqualification of the district attorney is something that basically affects anything that the state is doing in terms of, uh, you know, holding the state was 
there, her office was there today uh, uh, making argument before the judge. And if she is, in fact, disqualified by the Court of Appeals, then her office, you know, would not have the power to be there uh, making argument on behalf of the state. So that's the kind of argument I think maybe uh, they might uh, end up making before the Court of Appeals to convince it that McAfee cannot just retain partial jurisdiction. All right, there you go. There's the answer. As long as there is no stay, he can do anything except execute the sentence of uh, any of the defendants. Therefore, look for them if the Georgia Court of Appeals grants uh, a review to try to get them to stay as much of it as they can. All right. Quinta Jurassic, you have been extremely patient, sitting there in the corner, smiling, and now it is your turn. This is not a Trump trial. It is more of a Trump tribulation. It is a, uh, however, a John Eastman trial, at least on the civil side, and a Jeffrey Clark trial. What's going on in California and D.C. in these disbarment proceedings? Yeah, thanks, Ben. I was going to say, I think you're selling the the state bar court of California a little bit short. No, no, no. Um, <laughs> it's a, it's definitely a trial. It's just not a Trump trial. Very true. Um, so yes. Yeah, so as uh, listeners may be aware, um, the state bar court of California recommended that John Eastman be disbarred. Uh, yesterday, late yesterday, um, the judge really, I have to say, kind of filed at the very last minute after already giving herself a, a few weeks extension. Um, but, you know, I've been late on my work, too, so I can sympathize. Uh, it's a pretty whopping ruling. It's a basically 128-page sort of total excoriation of Eastman. Essentially, uh, ruling against him on, I think, all but one of the charges brought by the state bar authorities, finding that he violated numerous aspects of California's business and professions code. And interestingly, also finding that he uh, more likely than not uh, violated 18 U.S.C. 371, the conspiracy statute. Um, so this is this is actually the second civil case in which a judge has found that Eastman would likely engaged in criminality following the ruling, I believe, by Judge David Carter um, involving uh, the crime fraud exception to attorney client privilege, where Judge Carter found that uh, uh, Eastman had more likely than not violated uh, 18 U.S.C. 1512 C2, um, obstruction of an official proceeding, also in the January 6 uh, context. So there are a lot of, of interesting details here uh, that I can I can go into, although they may be interesting only to me uh, in their in their granularity. But the bottom line is that uh, we now do have a recommendation that Eastman be disbarred. If you look him up on the California Bar website, uh, his license is inactive. Um, it will be inactive until the California Supreme Court weighs in. Um, and Eastman has so the the court in issuing its judgment said this this will now go to the California Supreme Court, which oversees the bar, which is an agency of uh, the California Supreme Court because state bars are uh, creatures of of state courts. Apologies for all of the confusion. There are a lot of different courts here flying around. Uh, so eventually, we'll go to the California Supreme Court. Um, but Eastman has also said that he is appealing it, and I believe that appeal will go to a uh, intermediate body that is called the Review Board. Um, so this may take a while, basically. Flying back across the country to Washington, D.C., uh, we also have disciplinary hearings going on in the case of Jeffrey Clark, um, the DOJ official who attempted to execute a mini coup within the department with Trump's assistance. Um, so in California, the, the bar had actually explicitly begun the proceedings against Eastman, saying they were seeking his disbarment. I do not believe that D.C. bar authorities have said what specific punishment they are seeking for Clark. They're just bringing these charges against him. The charge in question uh, has to do with this letter that he prepared, um, the draft memo to be sent to Georgia legislators saying that the Justice Department had found election irregularities such that the state legislature should, you know, look into whether or not the election was carried out properly and perhaps holding back on on sending uh, electoral votes to the to the count. 
Um, the trial is now ongoing. I see someone has in the chat put in the chat that uh, Matt Gates is testifying, which is a great sign. Uh, the bar authorities have rested their case against Clark um, after two days of, of, I think, pretty damning testimony from a variety of former Justice Department and uh, White House officials. Um, and now we're on to Clark's defense, which at least the parts of it that I watched mostly consisted of uh, quote unquote expert witnesses arguing that, you know, there was real reason to believe that there were election irregularities. I think that the the main interesting thing that happened uh, yesterday was uh, in response to uh, so so uh, Clark was actually called to the stand um, and and testified although he responded to essentially every question with what he referred to as a uh, phalanx of privileges. <laughs> um, I'm not even sure I can name them all off the top of my head without them in front of me, but it was executive privilege. Uh, deliberative process privilege, law enforcement privilege, attorney client privilege, and the Fifth Amendment. I think I've gotten them all. And there was an interesting moment where it's he- pretty awesome, by the way, to re- to invoke both law enforcement privilege and the Fifth Amendment privilege Hell yeah. in the same invocation. I mean, that's a little bit like putting a humidifier and a dehumidifier in the same room. <laughs> well, that, so that actually gets to what I was about to say in terms of the attorney-client privilege issue. So Clark has made this attorney-client privilege argument throughout um, these proceedings and other proceedings, he has never, as far as I know, actually specified who the client is, which is important because he was essentially a- attempting to usurp his superiors at the Department of Justice who were saying, we don't think that we should do this. So to the extent that you know DOJ and the American people are his client, that seems like a bit of a weird argument, especially because those people are now testifying against him. <laughs> um, However, uh, so he he was pushed on this and actually said on the stand, um, I don't have the precise language in front of me, but uh, that his client was uh, Donald Trump. Um, Yes, it was uh, Trump, President Trump, and I quote, the unitary head of the executive branch. Um, And after he said that, I think everyone in the room sort of clearly realized that something had happened that should not have happened. I should say I was just watching on Zoom, but Clark's counsel immediately stood up um, and intervened. There was a bit of a back and forth, um, and the chair of the hearing committee, Merrill Hirsch, then essentially said, you know, Mr. Clark, you may want to be careful (laughs) in how you answer these questions, because essentially, depending on how much you tell us about the nature of the client and this attorney-client relationship, you may actually waive the attorney-client privilege that you are now invoking. Um, you know, if he says anything about how that relationship came to be formed, <laughs> right? So after that, uh, it quickly became a lot less exciting, and he just went back to his his phalanx of privileges again. Um, but I, I do think that uh, that was a, an interesting moment and kind of a very, very nerdy bit of breaking news. I will confess, I haven't had time to fully think through what the significance of this is and how it may ripple out beyond Jeffrey Clark personally, but it was notable. Let me pose a question about the significance of this, because I've seen a lot of Justice Department lawyers argue a lot of cases in federal court, and uh, they always stand up and say the same thing when they introduce themselves. They they say, on be- uh, uh, hi, I'm Benjamin Wittes, uh, Your Honor, I'm here on behalf of Donald Trump, the unitary president of the unitary executive president of the United States, right? That's how Justice Department lawyers always introduce themselves, right? No, the yeah, answer to that correct. question is no, Quinta. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. I'm, Roger, I was Googling, Roger, I was Googling, I was Googling the name of another witness who I was about to reference. Yeah, yeah, I'm I sorry. Tell you, paying me the, the, <laughs> the, the, the attention and deference that I'm due. <laughs> Roger, how do Justice Department lawyers introduce themselves at hearings? I represent the United States. Right. They don't say I represent the president, right? There are lawyers who represent the presidency, they are not the Justice Department lawyers. They are the lawyers of the White House Counsel's Office, right? Uh, yeah. So Which when, is distinct from the lawyers who represent the individual president, which right, is, all, who is an even separate, separate person, right? That they represent him in his personal interests. That's, but 
for a Justice Department lawyer to say, I represent the president, is actually simply a false statement, right? So there was a bit of a back and forth about this. Um, and we actually saw some uh, more back and forth about this today, which has to do with the witness whose name I was desperately trying to look up when I nodded in response to your your setup and completely whiffed on it. Um, and with apologies, I still cannot find this witness's name. So apologies to him. But this was a expert witness um, on behalf of Clark um, speaking to sort of legal ethics matters. Um, and there there was an exchange with a member of the hearing committee who asked him, you know, who who do you understand the client to be? Uh, there was kind of a weird back and forth where the witness said, I think the client is the Department of Justice, and then said it wasn't the Department of Justice, it was the executive branch or the government as a whole. Um, and there was some sort of further confusion about, you know, all right, well, if we have the executive branch and the president is at the head of it, then, you know, how do we understand the role of the president in this attorney-client relationship? Um, and frankly, everybody seemed to be a little uncertain on that, although I will say that um, Hamilton Fox, who is leading the Office of Disciplinary Counsel effort here, then asked a, a question as to whether this witness was aware of the provision in uh, the DC uh, Code of Professional Conduct regarding the client of a government lawyer. Um, and I, again, I don't have it in front of me right now, but I, I believe that the relevant provision that he's referencing specifies that if you're a government lawyer, the client is the agency you're serving as a part of. Um, now, of course, Clark, I think the specific language that he used in his response, which I confess I did not get verbatim because of how quickly this all happened. But he did say uh, President Trump um, as the unitary head of the executive branch. I think what he is trying to do there is say, well, even if I'm a Justice Department lawyer and the acting attorney general and the acting deputy attorney general disagreed with me as a Justice Department lawyer, I'm ultimately responsible to the president himself, the unitary head of the executive branch, and I was acting on his behalf. But things get very complicated there and you start getting into this question of privilege waivers. Anna, did you want to weigh in? Yeah, I was just going to say that's exactly when I when we were in federal court. And so and just for people to kind of know this because I think that it's flown under the radar. Uh, Clark's being represented in this proceeding by the same attorney, Harry McDougald, who represents him in Fulton County uh, and has been representing him as well in his removal proceedings in Fulton County. Uh, but so they've been very kind of consistent in a lot of these arguments that they're making in federal court and in Fulton County State Court and then now in the bar disciplinary proceeding in which the conduct that is alleged for that proceeding overlaps with the charges in Fulton County. Uh, and, and Harry McDougald in federal court during the removal proceedings, uh, during that evidentiary hearing made the same argument uh, about, you know, it doesn't matter what DOJ policy is about and, and what the supervisors were saying, the ultimate kind of, you know, person that Clark was, answerable to was the president of the United States and the commander in chief head of the executive branch. So um, it it fits with kind of this argument that they've been making for, for many months now. Yeah, I will just say when the Justice Department files an indictment, the indictment does not say the president of the United States unitary ahead of the unitary executive versus Anna Bauer. It says the United States versus Anna Bauer. And when the Justice Department files a civil lawsuit, it doesn't say the president of the United States versus uh, Tyler McBrien. It says the United States versus Tyler Bryan. Just saying. I want to. I want to say I've successfully located um, the witness whose name made me fall on my face. It is uh, E. Donald Elliott, who is an uh, adjunct professor of law at Yale Law School. Just to give everyone, and credit. he will be uh, uh, punished in the next life for having tripped you up as a result of. Uh, um, all right, we are ready to go to audience questions. We have gotten through all the stuff in all these different courts. So if you are the person uh, who said he wants to read his own question, uh, ping uh, our producer request to be able to speak, and we will make that happen. In the meantime, Leela asks, 
Why, especially after hearing from employee number five, has Bedminster not been searched? It seems reasonable to assume that there are more classified documents, and if so, a case could be brought in a jurisdiction that lacks the most Trump excellent helper, the Honorable Eileen Cannon. Uh, so, Roger, do you have thoughts on this? What's the, um, why don't we have a Bedminster case or at least more Bedminster action? Well, uh, unfortunately, I, I might be the only person that still hasn't seen that interview of the uh, of, of employee five. Um, I mean, I would have answered. Maybe I should stop there, but I, I would have answered before. I, I don't know how how if if you're going to search something, your information has to be very recent, and you know you need to if if something was once there. Uh, you know, it can't be a year ago because there's no reason to believe it's still there. But, you know, to, to, uh, some people wanted to indict because he waived the documents, you know, in Bedminster. But you need to build the whole case. And what makes, you know, you need to prove willfulness. And what makes the case here is this months and months and months of willful retention and and the pattern of uh, behavior and the obstruction and the lying and the conspiracy and and you you can't just sort of go in and say, well, he's possess you know he possesses one document here in Bedminster and and bring that uh, there there'd be huge uh, you'd have to there'd be huge uh, re redundancy and, and uh, I don't think it's practical. So uh, we know from some really great reporting in the Washington Post that the FBI was extraordinarily hesitant to search Mar-a-Lago. Um, and that string of words, the FBI was extraordinarily hesitant to search, um, I don't think has ever been uttered before in the English language, <laughs> except in the context of Mar-a-Lago. Um, usually the Bureau is really rearing to go. And I think that that also points to some of the kind of institutional dynamics behind the situation that Roger is describing. If you're the government here, there are a lot of reasons why you want to play this very, very carefully. Um, but there is also, we know that agencies have been reluctant in the past to really kind of go in and throw the book um, at, at Trump. And I'm sure that that's playing a role here too. Yeah. Also, uh, look, if you could tell Jack Smith uh, of several months ago or a year and a half ago, uh, what was going to play out in South Florida, I would bet money that he would have tried to establish venue in the District of Columbia. They took a risk. They decided to play it very straight. And by doing that, they took a risk that they would end up, and they knew it was a risk, with Judge Cannon. Uh, risk panned out. I am sure there are regrets about that decision. Uh, that said, they are not conducting further grand jury activity that I can detect in any of these cases. The unindicted co-conspirators in the January 6th case remain unindicted. And as one of them told Anna Bauer, we're done. You know, uh, John Eastman, you know, practically said we're in the clear on the Fed side. So they're not even prosecuting uh, people they've identified as unindicted co-conspirators. And I think they're very unlikely to go back to the well just because they've got these two very clean cases, very focused on Donald Trump. And I think they want to keep it that way. That is a strategic litigation decision, not a comment on anything else. But the result is that I don't think you're going to see action in Bedminster. Just one citizen's opinion, but uh, that's my gut. Yeah. And if I could just jump in real quick to clarify the John Eastman comment, uh, he told me in January when I spoke to him uh, that he has never received a target letter in the federal investigation in which he is an unindicted co-conspirator. That's the federal D.C. Jan 6 case. Uh, he also said that his understanding is that there is no more grand jury activity in that case. I think it was only the month before that conversation, though, that uh, uh, Politico, I believe it was uh, Kyle Cheney and Josh Gerstein, reported that DOJ uh, had ordered some transcripts related to John Eastman's bar hearing. Uh, 
So it could be that they're still maybe collecting some of that type of information, but maybe it relates more to uh, preparing for the Judge Chutkin trial of Trump as opposed to uh, doing further investigation related to the unindicted co-conspirators in that case. All right. Uh, Auntie Ruakonen joining us from Finland. Uh, the floor is yours. Thanks, Ben. So could Judge Cannon be in so far over her head that she's going to studiously avoid ruling on anything for as long as humanly possible and hope that a second Trump term will make the case go away? Thank you. So it's a, it's a very good question, and I think that's actually what she's doing de facto, if not uh, intentionally. She's uh, She literally hasn't issued a single major substantive ruling. Uh, there have been a few, there was, you know, this one motion to dismiss that she treated as a motion for an irrational jury instruction. Uh, and there's, you know, there's been a couple of other minor things that she's dealt with, but she really actually has not ruled on anything. And, you know, whether that's a deliberate strategy of trying to wait the thing out or whether it's kind of paralysis because she's in, as you say, way over her head, or whether it's because she's in the tank for Trump. I don't really purport to know what's in her head, but you've described objectively what she's doing. Roger, What am I being unfair? No. Um, I, I do think she, she is inexperienced. She has, um, she ha does want to be very careful and thorough, which are admirable things. And she, but she's being careful and thorough in the face of a strategy that is built on delay. And, you know, Trump's and his lawyers have both, Trump too, in publicly, they're, they're very clear they want delay. They've said it, in, in, you know, in all four cases. And, um, and the, the way they do that is by filing you know, at least uh, seven motions to dismiss uh, and to suppress in this one. And uh, they're asking for hearings in nearly everything. And um, so you need, you know, uh, an experienced judge says enough is enough. You cut through that Juan Merchan or Chutkin, you know, I understand you're trying to delay. We, we, we move on. And, um, she, the, the second factor besides this, you know, de wanting to be very careful, is that she seems to have an exceedingly hard time ruling against Trump. Uh, she seems to want to do everything possible to try to rule in his favor. That is a bad thing for me to be saying. And uh, it's a, if, if she's really doing that, it's a bad thing for her to be doing. But it, that's what it really looks like, even more to me than conscious delay. If somebody is trying to delay and you are stuck on trying to find that they've got valid arguments, it's, you know, uh, you, of course you can't rule because there's no way to rule, you know. So I don't know. There, it's a very, uh, whether it's delay itself or whether, I, I, I just can't say. All right. A few questions here. Uh, we have a bunch of additional questions, so I'm going to ask people to keep answers short. First question is for Quinta. Jeff asks, regarding Quinta's black hole scenario, I contend that you don't want any cases to resolve before the election because the most likely verdict is a hung jury, and that will be misunderstood as not guilty. And even if Trump receives a guilty verdict, that will just be interpreted as bias. What you really want is Trump acting like an ass in court during the vote, not a verdict before it. So um, for those who were not here last week, can you explain <laughs> the black hole theory and uh, then respond to Jeff's critique of it? Sure. So the, I don't have the post-it. Um, but essentially, the argument was that, you know, Trump's delay works very well for him right up until the point where it means that he starts a January 6th trial 
in, you know, late August, early September, such that he gets a verdict at, you know, the end of October, early November, which I think would be, you know, very bad for him if the verdict is indeed guilty. Um, so that's the that's the black hole. Um, to the the critique, I mean, I'm I I'm not a political strategist, so I can't speak to that. I do think from the perspective of the the Trump campaign, I do think that <sighs> There is a a disadvantage to anything having to do with the trial happening in the run up to the election, even if there is somehow a guilty verdict, just because, um, as the questioner points out, Trump is going to be complaining about this. He's going to be whining. It's going to be in the news. You know, reminding people of that is not great for his political prospects. It'll be on people's minds. Um, And so I think that's. Um, that's sort of part of what I was trying to to get to there. Um, I do think, I mean, the polling on this is super unreliable, but there is a significant amount of polling that indicates that people at least say when they are asked by pollsters that they would be less likely to vote for him um, if he was convicted of a serious crime. Uh, so I'm sort of keeping that in mind. But of course, It's not like we've ever seen this kind of situation before. Um, I know from talking to people who do polling work that those kinds of, you know, if X, would you Y are difficult to really calibrate properly. So who knows? All right. The next question uh, comes from uh, from Doug. And uh, uh, Tyler, I'm going to start this one with you. I have some thoughts on it as well. Doug asks, can you discuss whether you think that Alvin Bragg's team has a decent argument that the false business records were done with the intent to commit another crime uh, in order to achieve the felony step up? Uh, uh, do you have thoughts on this, Tyler? I think this is the question. Um, we we discussed this question in, in Rational Security this week of, of whether or not this case is the is the runt of the litter, so to speak, um, because of this tortured fact pattern, you know, whether a jury will be convinced. I haven't come down one way or the other yet. I, I, I'd be curious what, what your thoughts, Ben. So I, I spent a little time with this question when Justice Marchand issued his omnibus ruling on the motion, the various motions to dismiss. This was supposedly the great weakness of this case. And, you know, the many analysts who had critiqued this case all cited this as some novel legal theory that was kind of extravagant. And Justice Mershon did not treat it that way. He treated it as a perfectly pedestrian application of New York law, and he discussed it and rejected it in the space of, I don't know, five, six pages. It really seems like it's a argument that conservatives loved because it allowed them to reject the case. And a lot of liberal commentators kind of fell in love with because this wasn't the case that they cared about. And so um, everybody kind of jumped on the supposed novelty of this step up uh, as though as though they knew what the New York case law was. And it actually turns out that at least in Justice Marchand's view, the New York case law sort of supports this not as an unambiguous matter, but as a uh, as a non as a not especially interesting application of the statute. And so I think um, uh, a lot of people probably had their knees jerk on this because they didn't like the case for other reasons. But I think if Trump is going to win this, it is going to be because they really discredit the witnesses, not because there's something legally peculiar about this application of the statute. Um, I'm curious, uh, Roger and Anna and Quinta, whether you disagree with that. I I don't see a legal problem. And uh, it's not even, the step up is not solely uh, the Federal Election Campaign Act charge. There's also a a state tax charge that it could be um, uh, facilitating or concealing. And a state uh, uh, campaign finance charge, too. Uh, Yeah. Although the state campaign finance charge 
uh, uh, it sort of gets back to the federal charge, but uh, at least as I understand it. But I don't, I don't think the legal problem, plus they bring this charge very, I mean, not on these exact facts, but they know what they're doing. This is a, they bring it about once a week. I mean, there's an indictment over the last 10 years for these type of charges about once a week. There have been over 400 uh, such, such charges. The, I think it's more of a factual problem that the facts are stale and there's going to be this over, uh, it's not like, uh, you know, beating up 140 uh, police officers, one of whom dies. And, and it has this overarching sense that, you know what, it looks a little like Stormy Daniel was shaking, say, shaking him down, you know, like, you know, it, 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 he does seem a little like the victim here. And um, so I, I, there's ways, it, 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 there's sort of a jury nullification aspect of it, like, uh, why are the, you dredging all this? I, I remember all this. And then, of course, the the weirdest thing is that we all know at this point that this guy, nothing you know, he, he's total Teflon. You know, the, the notion that, oh my God, he, he had sex with Stormy Daniels, that this would bring him down. Look at what, look at what, where we are now. You know, he, he's, he's the leading candidate. Two impeachments after four indictments after, you know, January 6th. It, it's like, that's the theory of this case. It, it's, it's, I think those are the problems. Yeah. So what you're saying is ev that they need to read Quinta's piece on the case, which is called, is it called This Is Actually Quite Bad? I, <laughs> yeah, I wrote a piece for The Atlantic after it was charged that was t literally titled This Is Actually Quite Bad. So shouts to my to my editor uh, for for that one. I did not title it. But yeah, I mean, I don't want to go in too deep, but I do, I do think there is there's a way to frame it at least rhetorically, I, separate from the sort of the question of the strength of the charges, which I, I will admit I haven't had a chance to go into yet, that this is an example of election manipulation um, in the same way that the Russia investigation was, although in a different manner and, and to uh, a different degree, and also speaks to Trump's sort of conflation of the office of the presidency with his personal benefit. He's signing these checks to Cohen while he's in the Oval Office. And his sort of overall, the extent to which he's suited uh, to the office. So that's more of a sort of political argument or an argument about, you know, his uh, the extent to which he's suited to swear the oath of office than it is uh, about the specific strength of the charges. Um, but I do, uh, I'll, I'll defend this case, <laughs> at least on those counts. All right. Rapid fire questions. Josh Knight asks, after reading Roger Parloff's Wednesday article on mandamus actions, I got the impression that it will be hard to keep Judge Cannon from preventing a conviction of Trump or anyone else in the documents case. That is very depressing. Did I get the wrong impression? From preventing a... That it'll conviction. be hard to prevent Judge Cannon from actually scuttling the case. Well... I think it will be hard to prevent her from scuttling the case. Um, I do think that mandamus, uh, there is precedent for bringing it. And, uh, but I think ultimately you can't win this case without somehow getting a different judge. And, um, and then there's also the hurdle of a, of a, of a jury in South Florida. Uh, which is probably, you know, uh, uh, going to be sympathetic. So there's a lot of hur hurdles in this case. I'm going to give you hope. I believe in juries everywhere, and a properly selected jury will presumptively do as instructed. And Judge Cannon uh, is undisciplined, and eventually she is going to have to rule on some of these motions. And when she does, she will screw up and they will take her to the 11th Circuit. And uh, uh, that is my prediction. Um, and it's going to – like you can't not rule forever. Um, and she's a genuinely bad judge. And once she rules, she will, uh, she will be very vulnerable to appellate action. All right. We've got four minutes. Kerry asks, I'm curious to know if there is a theory as to why Judge Cannon is not docketing things. Is that unusual? And could it be related to the clerk issues that David Latt reported on? 
Roger, what do we know about why things aren't aren't showing up on the docket? Uh, it's unrelated to the clerks, except in let you know, in, in, unless there were is a manpower issue. No, the, what what happened here is back in about February sixth, I think she she. Uh, decided to depart from the local rules and exactly why I, I I don't know I think she was fed up with she felt the the uh, government was uh, redacting too much and filing too many redacted motions uh, filing too many sealed motions and so she said we're we're abandoning the local rules here uh, you can't file anything under seal or redacted without getting my permission first by, with a public, by filing a motion that publicly explains why there's a compelling reason this needs to be under seal, which is a hard thing to do without showing uh, the judge the document and uh, or giving away what you're, what you're trying to keep hidden. And then in order to uh, meet deadlines, she allowed the uh, to to the the lawyers to adopt a procedure well well because there is, there wasn't time to do this pre motion before the motion so she let them start circulating by email all of their the, the motions that had sensitive information and the idea was that they would be docketed once uh, there would be uh, either the parties could reach agreement about what should be redacted or they would take the problem to her and she would make decisions. But instead, uh, we've got this secret docket. And actually, there's something a little bit uh, analogous, at least, going on in New York. There's also stuff under protective order that Trump wants to keep using uh, and 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 the protective order might be overbroad. I don't I don't know all the facts up there, but there too uh, he dev he began a procedure where you sort of need to do a uh, cir circulate motions by email first, and then when everyone's on 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 the same page about what's redacted and what isn't, then that's filed. And so what we often get. In the New York case, is is we'll see. Oh, there's a new filing, and then you look at it, and the date will be March 18th or something. So something analogous is happening there. So it's not totally crazy, but it does seem to be getting totally out of hand. And the weirdest thing is that the whole reason for this is that she wants to be super public, and and the result is we get a secret docket where we we've never seen, you know, at least. Uh, three of Trump's uh, motions and at least, I think, three of Nauta's motions and, and so on. I will just point out that between uh, Judge Cannon's secret docket and Fulton County's dead docket, um, uh, it's uh, quite a, uh, a, a, a project keeping up with the filings in these cases. All right. We we are going to close with two questions that I'm going to handle myself. Uh, William asks, last week, a CNN analyst familiar asserted that the chief judge of the circuit could intervene sua sponte in the Docs case to assure the proper administration of justice. Such a development is unlikely before the next canon hearing, which is April 2nd, and there's no precedent for it. But what are the Chief Justice's possible choices? I will just say that anybody who said that on CNN should not be allowed back on CNN. The jurisdiction of the case resides in the district judge, um, not in, uh, in, in the, in the district court, not in the Chief Judge of the Circuit, um, which is a position, uh, of an appeals court. Uh, courts do not intervene in trial cases sua sponte. Um, it just doesn't happen. And so I don't know who said this on CNN, but strongly suggest that you shut off the television the next time this person is speaking, or at least mute it. Um, the last question will go to Laura Donna, who sent me uh, this week the single most outrageous and awesome piece of mail I have received in a very long time. 
She asks, the term equity in your world appears unrelated to general fairness or natural justice. Can you explain why a ruling that is equitable is actually better, or better than application of the law without equity, more interested in a good example than in how the concept evolved historically? So let me just say uh, the premise is wrong. The concept of equity in litigation or in, in, in law just means general fairness. Um, and so when you say a court is exercising equitable jurisdiction or is finding a principle in equity, that principle is just a kind of as distinct from law how things should work. Roger looks like he's prepared to object. Yeah, I well, I don't know what got, uh, prompted her question. I mean, there there is a distinction between courts in law, courts in equity, right? And and if that's what she's talking about, that's a you know a term of art. It means something different. It it means you know courts that in, in, like injunction cases as opposed to jury cases. Uh, I, I don't. I, I I'm not sure if that's what you're. What, what the questioner had in mind, that's just, you know, goes way back in common law and, and, uh, I, I'm not prepared to, to but uh, then explain there's how the that happened. of law and equity. And so there's technically not separate courts, but be between equity, cause there used to be courts of law and courts of equity, as Roger said, back in the like olden days in English law. And then there was the fusion of law and equity. So now we still refer to, equity or equitable powers or that kind of thing. But there's really not any difference other than- They're not separate courts that, anymore. Yeah, that historical kind of uh, separation between the two. I still remember when I was a young editorial writer, uh, a giant opinion in, Roger will remember this case, the case of Inslaw showed up in my on my uh, desk and it was uh, an opinion of the Court of Claims. And the last line of it was, Inslaw has shown no principle in law or equity by which they should recover. Any recovery for Inslaw would be a gratuity. And I thought, what a great formulation. Um, it was a great sentence. It stuck with me for these 30 years. Um, but uh, for present purposes, think of it as, in law, right? There's some explicit legal rule that says you can't do this, you did this, therefore you have to pay blah, right? Uh, or just principles of general uh, fairness or whatever say, hey, it sucked that this happened to you, you should recover. Uh, law versus equity. Um, we're going to leave it there because the more I talk about this, the more likely it is that I am just spouting nonsense. So from the Scott studio, Roger Parloff, from the uh, uh, Martha Stewart kitchen studio, Tyler McBrien, from the snake plant studio in her palatial mansion, Anna Bauer, and from the Ansel Adams studio, Quinta Jurassic, and me... From the uh, the mask studio, uh, we will catch you next week. The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with, can you guess? It's not AEI. It's not Carnegie. It's the Brookings Institution. And you can get ad-free versions of this and other Lawfare Podcasts by becoming a Lawfare Material supporter through our website. Don't want to hear me reading the ads? I can't imagine why not. Lawfaremedia.org slash support. Sign up and you'll never hear another ad. You'll also be able to pose questions to our panel on shows like this and become part of our conversation by joining the webinar on Riverside, available only to our supporters. This podcast is edited by Jen Patya Howell, and our audio engineer this episode was the estimable Anna Hickey of Lawfare. Our music is, as always, performed by Sophia Yan, and as also, as always, thanks for listening. <laughs>